Thanks very much, Jamie. That was extremely useful. Um, and I know you're all thinking of how can I run a festival for myself. <laughs> uh, don't think like that. Think of the, the, the key message for me. I mean, sorry, do run a festival. It's a brilliant idea uh, if, you can, if, if your product suits it and if your area suits it. The key message for me was something that I think we should, I've always thought we should make more of, and Jamie is making the most of it, which was the sense of place in Argyll. Now, we actually have our own word for that, which they don't have over there. Uh, it's an Irish word which, is very difficult, which there's no direct translation for, but I'd just like you to go back and look at that word, dinshanicus, and go back and see the meaning of that word and see how much it applies to a lot of the companies that are represented here, because I don't think we make enough of that. And I think Jamie has shown just how you can make so much out of your own place. Now, we're ready for questions. Um, do, you, do you want to invite Steve? Yeah, do you want to, do you want to come up? On, uh, there's some chairs there. Yeah. 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 Um, the usual rules apply. If you want to ask a question, you've got to give your name and the company you represent. Just in case there's any brewers or any Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the brewing industry were friendly. We all talked yeah, yeah, to each yeah, other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, There's a microphone here as well. Thank you. Um, guys, I'm just wondering from a social media point of view, do you guys both run your own social media or you go, do you guys outsource your social media? I think we're always in the room first. So, yeah, at Hippies, we've always um, done our um, social media internally and ran it completely internally. Yeah. From the okay. beginning, uh, I think it's the best way, it's the best sort of lens into our consumer that we've ever had. And you know, when you're a small brand, and you don't have access to the consumer insight or anything like that. That's the best way to sort of, you know, if this is on, to get feedback about your product and everything like that. So yeah, we've always managed it internally. Yeah. Um, yeah. No. Likewise. I mean, I think we've been through phases. Oh, you might have. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you know, we've um, it, there was a phase when I used to do it all myself. And to be honest, it was just exhausting. Um, it was kind of, as I said, it was kind of the good days. And then as it just got more and more and more, and you're just trying to do it yourself, and you're kind of always on, it's kind of not very good for your mental health. So now I have a marketing manager, and it's not very good for his mental health, but he loves it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but I, th I think if you want to be authentic, I think you do need to do it yourself. I, I think... I certainly used to feel, and perhaps these days I just, I just don't know, I don't pay enough attention, but I used to feel you could spot the breweries that had passed it out to somebody else, and it just didn't work, you know. It's got to be fresh, it's got to be sort of snappy and on, the, on point and of, of the moment. Yeah. Thank you. Next. There's a few here now, too. We take... Uh, you say the question to Jamie Chabon that you go from uh, Terry to Constitution. Um, how do you balance between getting the sort of the need to keep when you launch it, be your sort of growing, be as big as it can possibly be, and therefore as commercially viable, um, with the need to keep it small and, and authentic and pure, I guess, from the farm. How do you, how do you, how do you understand? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting one. I mean, it's part of the reason that, from a brewing perspective, it's nice. Um, you know, we are miles from anywhere, um, so a lot of our staff are having to drive up from um, Danoon, which is 40 minutes away, or Glasgow, that's an hour and a quarter away, or an hour and a half in traffic. Um, so we need, to, we, need to, we need to sort of somehow fit with our environment. You know, we take our water that gets um, just straight from the stream coming down the hill behind the brewery. We have them treat our effluent before it goes out to the Salmon River that goes past the brewery. Um, it's all got to fit within where we are. That said, you know, because of the nature of brewing, um, yeast cells are fantastic. We employ trillions of yeast cells. They, they never want a day's holiday. In fact, you, they can't even take a day off. You have to, have to keep them clean, fed, and happy, and keep on producing the whole time. So it's actually quite an easy one to roll out. We just need more and more tank space. So we've actually got quite a lot more um, our old sheep shed to convert steadily to brewery. Um, although I negotiated with my mother. Um, <laughs> so... Um, so yeah, so, so I, think, I think we can actually go quite a long way while still fitting comfortably within our own environment. I think there will come a point where that becomes a bigger challenge and we'll have to then think about whether we then need to put a production brewery, another bigger production brewery somewhere else. <coughs> but to be honest, I mean, you know, for the next 
five, five, five to ten years, we've, we can do all of that within our current site. It's not that space intensive. It's not that bigger footprint somehow. Jamie, if there's any consolation, uh, Siobhan, who asked the question, works for a company which started in a field in Listow with a little stream running through it, <laughs> right. and it's now one of the biggest food and drink companies in the world. <laughs> uh, there's a question here, yeah. Yeah, um, Rachel from Brickfix Plastics. Question for you, Jamie. Uh, the, the origins range for spontaneous fertilizer sounds really interesting. I was wondering, do you face any challenges with, uh, I suppose, spontaneously fermented kind of selling that in in a world that you know, food quality and, and tech requirements are for a big company that's certainly a big part of our lives to bring something to market. Is that, are you slow yeah. to get around that or is that kind of hard? No, I mean, well, I think, I think we're, we're probably, we are relatively small. Um, I don't think there's any change in the regulations just because we're small. Um, we are in Argyle. That's a bigger factor because when you're in Argyle, you're talking to um, very sensible people. Um, generally, even in even in the, in the local government in Argyle, we have nice, sensible people, and um, and they sort of we've built up a good reputation of trust with them. Um, then at the same time, I have a very good um, German um, technical brewer um, who's got a very understands the whole HACCP process very well. And then working within beer, we're an inherently a relatively safe product space from a sort of a consumer um, safety point of view, which was the question, was it? Yeah. Yeah, you look like I'm not asking the yeah, question, sorry. Also, um, the difference in quality was that you spawn me to not be able to control what happens, which can have beautiful results, but equally, you yeah. can get a batch that you can't use. Oh yes, so, you know, I mean, we we we're not afraid about pouring pouring beer away. Um, there, there there will there will be things which will go wrong. Um, you know, we've we've um, we had um, a couple of. A lot, of the, a lot of that stuff is being fermented in um, either wine or, um, or bourbon barrels. Um, and so just depending really on the barrel quality when it comes in, there are ways that, that beers can go wrong. Um, you know, you can get a real sort of acetone sort of um, nail varnish flavour coming through, um, or you can get um, at any sign of mould growth is, is what you're really worried about from a consumer safety perspective. But just in terms of off flavours, um, beers can often go wrong Actually, not that often. Rarely beers will actually go badly wrong. Sometimes they'll evolve in ways you don't necessarily want. But then what we're thinking about is a blending process. So sometimes something which doesn't taste great actually, as part of a three-way blend, proves itself to be really valid and interesting. So um, there's, it's really something that's generally going really badly wrong before we're throwing it away. And then if it's just something that's a bit meh, then sometimes a really nice fruit addition <laughs> still makes a great beer. <laughs> so, um, so sometimes, you know, you can, you can mask it or take it in another direction. So sometimes you can blend it, sometimes you can mask it. <laughs> Thank you. Yep, there's Mike coming down now. Hi guys, um, this is just for the hippie guys, the question. Um, my name's Evelyn, I'm just from a company called Simply Fit Food. Um, we're a very small brand, we're only new to retail since January and we're, we're growing quite quickly within the fresh food space. But just in terms of um, something you actually mentioned in terms of thinking global from the beginning, um, I thought that was a, a really good point. Um, and in terms of, I suppose, challenges that you have faced since the beginning three years ago, is there a single biggest challenge that you faced in terms of scaling the brand into new markets? Um, and if so, would you mind sharing what that might be? Um, and for smaller companies coming up, um, have you got any tips on how to avoid those? <laughs>
think globally and retain that really global look and feel as we've sort of grown to swell. So people, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> and where did Mr. DiCaprio come in? Yeah. Um, didn't come into the office. That's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> internally as well until you do something like this and you're like oh my god yeah um and yeah it was a huge sort of turning point for the brand in terms of what's an amazing guitar cover drop it like that and also in terms of conversation with retailers it's been super powerful as well it's an amazing turning point any more oh sorry over here yeah the microphone this and the thanks guys <laughs> yeah, but everybody in the back may not be able to hear you hang on yeah. <laughs> Coming around now. Uh, John from Wicklow Wolf Brewery. Uh, I've been looking enough to be here to your festival, Jamie, as I was telling you earlier on. Um, our, our brewery is, uh, is obviously in the, in the name, is very heavily uh, centered around the lo our location within Wicklow, uh, which isn't necessarily known around the world. Uh, your your brewery is the same. And how have you found that's uh, translated as you've moved into further field exports? Yeah. I think I think that is the um, that's 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 the challenge is um, if you're basing your story on place, you've got to turn it into a um, into a story which is sort of compelling for consumers everywhere else. And you know, a bit of the feedback that we had um, was um, talk, talking to people. And it's like you know, okay, so I'm, I'm working in an office in London, um, browsing through Facebook, you know. When you get to get finals posts up and you've kind of got pictures of like the Glen, you know, the things that we do that, that get the most likes on Instagram and, um, and um, Facebook are when we're going to stuff on the farm. When we got sort of pictures of, of um, the um, stew as our farmer feeding our deer flock, um, or when we've got like, you know, last week I think we had a guillemot got strand, stranded in the middle of the yard and we had to go and rescue the guillemot and get it out of the thing. It's these silly little sort of stories of the moment that just give a sense of place. But actually, if you're working in an office in London or Manchester or wherever, it's that little bit of escapism that people are looking for. So actually, we found it really resonates quite nicely with people all around the UK. Um, I think when we're sort of trying to get further afield, we've got to really think about what actually, um, why does it work? And it was why we went for the farm brewery. Um, I think, again, I'm, you know, I'm quite rude about Kantar and these kind of people, but one of the, um, the trends they've identified in alcohol is people sort of, they're called, they're now called, they used to call them health conscious consumers, they now call them health and conscious consumers, which is people who want food and drink products which are both healthy and good for the environment. And by sort of tying ourselves into this farm brewery strap line, we've made it sort of, we've tried to, tried to emphasize the fact that we do tie into the environment um, and where we're from. And I think it's looking for messages like that which somehow take your message about where you're from and finding ways to get it to resonate with people who aren't from just down the road from you. Because really, if we were tied to people who are just down the road from us, I think we'd be talking about a market of about 700 people. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you've got to, got to get out there. <laughs> Any more? Yeah. Joe, oh, beside you. Uh, Charles Smith from uh, Certified Irish Angus Beef. Um, just, it's a related question to the last one. Did you feel that you were able to deliver all that in the new look, uh, the new design, and the new logo, and the new branding? Well, we think we think we're, we're fairly happy with how it's um, with, with what it's achieved. It's certainly, you know, I, th I don't think visual identity is only one part of your marketing strategy. Um, so do I, do I think that that delivers the whole story? No, I don't think visual identity will ever be the whole story. But certainly the feedback that we've had and you know, what it's done for us and the product areas that we're seeing rapid growth in that we weren't seeing growth in before has worked absolutely. So, so we are trying to get both that sense of place but also that progressive part of the craft beer market. You know, we had this sort of dilemma where, you know, we, do, we have a very, you probably saw a little bit with that um, clip of the people that come to our festival. We actually have a very broad customer range, which really ranges from the sort of the hipsters um, from Glasgow, Manchester, London, um, through to the craft beer geeks who are flying in from wherever around the world, through to guys who have been enjoying rear pints of real ale in the local pubs since God was a boy. So you've got this very broad audience that we kind of had to keep and hold and carry with us, but we wanted to be a little bit more in the faster growing space, which was the craft beer space. 
So we needed to marry up the idea of providence and place with the progressive, slightly more urban edginess. And that's what we were trying to achieve. And the feedback so far is that it seems to be achieving it. Um, but, you know, nothing's perfect, and I'm sure we can improve. <laughs> so, um, and, I'm, and I'm also quite sure nothing's ever timeless either. You know, we've spent, we've, we've waited, you know, time, time will tell. Um, but, you know, we're one year into the rebrand, and it's certainly, the feedback's been very good so far. Any more? Oh, yeah. He's coming around now. Ladies, this is for you. Brendan Nolan here from Manor Farm Chicken. You mentioned your commitment to a couple of charities and your CSR commitments. What benefit has that been to you and how are you incorporated it into your marketing? So I guess it's at the heart of our communication since brand launch. So it was actually on pack, our social mission. Um, and then through all of our social media communications and PR communications, it's actually one of the things that picked up the most PR coverage for us as well, talking like that. And I guess it comes back to that core cool thing of millennials wanting to engage in brands that um, do more as well. And there's like loads of stats and research about how millennials are more likely to buy brands and give back to a greater cause. Yeah. And I guess we brought that to life through social media um, and yeah, our PR comms for sure. And I think in terms of when we're speaking to retailers, CSR is on the agenda for all retailers. So to be able to communicate to them what you're doing, um, it, it resonates with them and it's also another reason to list your product. So yeah, yeah from a commercial point of view, it's, it's another string to our bow. Yeah, yeah I, th I think it's an interesting point. Most of the companies who fall into the category of both of the presentations tonight have a very strong social purpose and you know, social responsibility kind of aspect to the brand. And, you know, it's no... I don't think it's any coincidence that if you noticed the Financial Times last week had a very dramatic front page. The entire front page on one day last week was just the word capitalism and underneath needs a reset. And I think what these companies are doing are examples of what the Financial Times I think is getting at in that they're companies who are resetting the way people do business. That it's not just about maximizing sort of shareholder value, it's about community, it's about the workforce, and it's about the wider world, and companies actually contributing to the wider world. So these companies are completely on trend. They're more, much more reflective of, I think, the way business is going than some of the big companies. Any more? One more question? Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Amory from Manor Farm. So I have another question just based on what Brendan just asked there. If the demographic or your target market was different um, around that CSR question, um, do you think you would place as much relevance on it? Um, and would it be as important to you as a brand? Um, I think it, it definitely was at the heart of the brand that Livio um, envisaged and created. However, I definitely think that the millennial consumer, with that in mind, that that is the audience that's most engaged with brands that give back. So I think the, the two definitely go hand in hand in terms of creating a brand that gives back and, and marketing towards millennials because we know that they're the audience that are most engaged. However, now that we're sort of rolling out to a wider consumer base across the UK, a family-based audience, the, the, the CSR point is just as relevant and all consumers want to know about it, all consumers talk to us about it. It's one of the things we get the sort of most engagement on social media from, from like a broad range of consumers. Um, and as Miriam said, it's the thing that one of the things that the retailers want to talk to us most about as well because their shoppers care about that as well. So yeah, definitely started as a hand in hand with build, building the millennium audience, but definitely translates across a wider consumer base as well. Okay, thanks very much. I'd like to thank Miriam, Rose and Jamie for not just extremely practical presentations, and I hope you've taken mental notes and are going to use some of the, 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 the lessons from these two brands, but also quite inspirational in the way they set up businesses, in their ambition and in the way they go about their business. So I'd like to thank them again. And there is food outside and drink, so please stay and have a little bit to eat and mix around and perhaps ask the speakers more questions. Thank you very much.